Uh, hello and good morning, everyone. We warmly welcome you to the next episode of Fraunhofer IPMS webinar session. My name, uh, my name is Andreas Hatzemann. I'm working at the business development department and I will guide you through this session. Today, Michael Wagner is joining our webinar session. He's head of business uh, units, Betier Light Modulators in our institute. Since 2003, he works at uh, Fraunhofer IPMS, responsible for research and development for Micromero Array. And since 2005, he's in charge of this business unit. Today, we want to take a closer look on this technology platform, introduce it to you, and give you a short overview of the current efforts in our institute. Before we start, just a few words I want to say about the webinar. The presentation will take around 20 to 30 minutes. During the webinar, you can contact us by using the chat function and send us your questions. After the presentation, we will have some time to take a closer look at these questions. Slides and the webinar will be provided after the webinar. So um, that's enough from my side. And we can switch to Michael Wagner and his presentation. Yeah, hello everybody. This is uh, Michael Wagner and uh, thank you very much, Andreas, for the uh, introduction. Um, thank you for uh, being interested um, in this uh, webinar. Uh, I will try to give you an insight, uh, more an overview um, on our activities in the area of uh, micromirror arrays, spatial um, light modulators, uh, within uh, the next, let's say, roughly half an hour. Um, just a minute. I will try to do that uh, going um, along uh, this um, outline. So uh, I will start uh, uh, to show you some micromirror array devices, uh, just as examples, uh, so that you can get a feeling what we are talking about. I will go then into some technical basics, uh, not too deep, uh, and then uh, switch to some examples of micromirror array applications. Um, then um, I will present some latest uh, developments um, and uh, conclude uh, with some outlook. So first point, um, Fraunhofer IPMS has a relatively large history in development of micromirror arrays. So, so in the meantime, it's more than 20 years. Um, and uh, the focus of our development so far um, has been on high resolution segmented mirrors. There is also um, a type of device where you, um, where you have membrane mirrors. So we are so far not looking into this uh, sector. Uh, another feature is most of the devices uh, have high to very high data rates, uh, so very fast devices. Um, another speciality, um, we have a strong focus on what we call analog micromirror deflection. Uh, I will come uh, to that later on, um, uh, what that means. Um, and there is uh, potentially and actually a broad application spectrum um, of uh, different wavelengths. We have from an, uh, simply an historical point uh, a strong focus on UV and deep UV um, uh, and in the meantime have extended that uh, for special devices and application towards visible and also the near infrared. So if we are talking about micromirror arrays, um, we of course also very briefly have to mention uh, Texas Instruments. Um, and I'll do that here on the lower left with just one example. There are a lot of devices. Um, and uh, what I clearly want to say is this is complementary technologies um, and basically uh, concerning two different aspects. I mentioned this uh, analog mirror deflections and uh, Texas Instruments um, DLP uh, is binary. That means uh, this device has um, 
uh, an on uh, um, position of the mirrors and an off position. This is not the case with our devices and um, also the wavelength range typically is uh, uh, 350, 355 and higher um, and, and we have capabilities in the UV and the deep UV as well. Um, great devices complementary to what we are doing. Also complementary is spatial light modulators based on uh, liquid crystal. And this is on the lower uh, right, you see an example uh, of an holo eye um, device. Um, so complementary here in the sense that um, it's once again also a wavelength range, um, uh, not capable in, in the UV and also in this case that the frame rates are um, uh, significantly lower. Uh, in this case here what we have in common is uh, the analog um, modulation capability. So some examples uh, of the uh, devices that we have developed so far and what I what I directly want to stress uh, here is uh, that this is um, a selection um, important uh, devices which we've developed together with customers. Um, we can't uh, unfortunately not disclose everything um, simply due to confidentiality reasons. So we are developing, typically developing these devices for customers and we of course only can um, communicate and disclose um, in case that the customer agrees. So this is all released uh, information. Um, one example, one million mirrors, uh, 16 micron mirror pitch. It's roughly 500 by uh, 2000 mirrors. Uh, the frame rate here is 2 kilohertz. Tilting mirrors means there is one tilt axis. Each mirror can be addressed individually. Um, something comparable here on the lower left, uh, this is a smaller device, 256 by 256 mirrors. Uh, same mirror pitch, roughly the same um, um, frame rate. Um, uh, just uh, for um, applications that do not need such a large device. Of course, the efforts to manufacture is lower uh, with uh, lower die sizes. Uh, for example, this is used in a microscopy application. I come later um, to that point. We are also offering a customer ev evaluation kit based on, on this device. Um, we are also, I want to mention that already early, trying to be as modular as possible. You will later on also see again this de uh, a photograph of this device, but with piston mirrors on top. So modularity means we can take the same uh, CMOS backplane uh, and apply different uh, mirrors, di different mirror functionalities on top. On the upper right, uh, you see a special, what we call a line device. There are 8,000 logical pixels uh, in this long direction. Um, and uh, effectively, it, it, uh, the whole device consists of 2.2 uh, million uh, tilting mirrors, but in this case, they are hardwired to 8,000 logical pixels. Um, a speciality here is the very high uh, speed. So uh, these mirrors are optimized for high speed, high data throughput, um, and um, they can be operated um, at uh, frequencies up to one megahertz. For example, if you compare this device, 8,000 logical pixels with this one, one million pixel, it's first of all sounds a little bit strange, but in fact this device has the higher data throughput potentially um, in combination with this one megahertz uh, operation uh, compared to the one, uh, one million mirror device. On the lower right uh, you see a piston type uh, mirror device. Uh, that means uh, here uh, the mirrors are not tilting but they are moving up and down. Um, once again, kilohertz uh, refresh rate, same um, ballpark. In this case, 40 micron uh, pitch, 
Um, and uh, this is um, a development that um, is um, several years old. Um, in the meantime, um, we had more focus on tilting mirrors, but we are back on uh, piston type mirrors. Uh, I will show you something later uh, on latest results. So some technical uh, basics. Um, on the upper right here, you see more or less the simplest version uh, of a micro mirror. It's basically a platform a mirror that is standing on two posts and underlying um, are two electrodes. And now by forming uh, these um, springs here um, in the area of the posts, um, you, you get a tilt axis here. And if you apply a voltage now, uh, there is a force that uh, leads to the fact that the mirror is tilting. Um, we're normally talking about, for most of the devices, talking about very high uh, number of pixels um, of mirrors on one uh, device, on one die. And that means we need on-chip electronics simply to distribute the uh, driving signal from, uh, let's say, some uh, limited number of uh, package pins to each individual mirror. And this is uh, shown here, um, indicated here. We have some underlying um, uh, electronics in each pixel uh, to drive each pixel. And of course, we have also electronics on the chip in the periphery uh, to select uh, the, uh, um, the pixel that we want to um, address. So um, on the upper right, uh, you see um, a SEM picture of uh, such a simple structure. Um, we call that one level actuator. Mirrors are typically, in our cases, aluminum or the core is uh, uh, typically an aluminum alloy. Um, and um, so this is good for demonstration purposes. It's the simple structure. What we do um, today is more or less 100% what we call a two-level actuator. Um, and this is shown uh, on, the, on the lower right. Um, this is from the design and from the processing a little bit more complex. So there are more layers we have to process. But on the other hand, this structure gives clear um, uh, benefits um, because what we are doing here is um, uh, separating the optical performance, so the mirror performance from the mechanical uh, performance. So what you see here in this SEM, uh, is that we have a nice uh, mirror, the fill factor, the optical fill factor here goes up because we no longer have the mechanical springs in this uh, level here. Um, and on the other hand, the mechanical springs get a, several, uh, a separate level uh, underneath. And this uh, enables us to choose the optimum uh, materials on one hand for the mirrors, uh, predominantly optical behavior then, and on the other hand, mechanical behavior. In this case, in the simple structure, we have to find a compromise between uh, these uh, different uh, necessary functionalities. So um, a few words on the uh, processing of these uh, devices. Um, we at Fraunhofer IPMS here have basically uh, the full chain of the processing um, in-house um, available. Um, this is a MEMS processing, which is called surface micromachining. So um, it means that the MEMS um, structures are formed from uh, thin films that are layer-wise deposited and uh, then also structured. Um, on a rigid, let's say rigid substrate. In this case, it's a it's a silicon um, it's a silicon wafer. 
most of the time it's a it's a CMOS um, uh, backplane. Um, so the other area which we don't use here is so-called bulk micromachining, where the MEM structures are formed uh, from the silicon bulk itself. So if you look uh, into these cross sections, uh, brief look into here, we start with some uh, CMOS. So you see here uh, driving electrodes. This is, let's say, the upper levels um, of, a, of a CMOS wafer, a CMOS circuitry. We start with that, do some planarization um, and put um, what we call a sacrificial layer um, on top. By the way, for these uh, CMOS, um, we have different options. So IPMS has an own high, would be called that high voltage CMOS in-house, uh, supplies voltages in the range of 30 volt. Um, and we can use that uh, to design and process our own backplane. However, there is of course a wide variety of different CMOS processes out in the market, um, uh, especially of course also with smaller feature sizes, uh, coming also with smaller voltages. Um, and we can use uh, foundry service here, external foundry service as well, uh, to use and design external uh, wafers uh, um, and doing uh, only uh, the MEMS and the interfacing in-house. So after this first sacrificial layer, this is patterned and then we put uh, on um, uh, the spring level, it's patterned again and then comes a second sacrificial layer. Uh, next point, this is patterned. Um, and uh, then uh, the mirror level um, is deposited and also patterned. And that's the point, it's not uh, yet, uh, the processing is not yet finished. Um, that's the point where the structures are all there, but uh, the mirrors can't move uh, because these uh, spacer or sacrificial layers are uh, still, uh, the sacrificial layers are still available or are still present. And one of the last steps in this whole processing is then etching, uh, taking these sacrificial layers away, etching them out. And by that, we end up with a freestanding, free movable mirror on top of um, electronics. And that's exactly what we need uh, for our um, devices. So um, I don't have a slide here. Um, uh, just want to mention it um, on um, simulation. A simulation is a very, very important uh, point uh, in this uh, development chain uh, since we can't rely on, uh, it's quite understandable, we, we can't rely on uh, trial and error, uh, too costly and too time consuming. So what we do before we do designs, then we, we do the uh, the, the simulation uh, and from that uh, uh, come up with designs that are then processed in the clean room. Um, very, very important thing also in this development chain is uh, characterization of uh, micro mirrors. Uh, this is really uh, um, a field uh, on its own. Uh, here are some examples. Uh, you see on the upper left, a white light interferometer surface profile. Uh, of uh, an, a mirror area um, where the mirrors are um, deflected. Um, uh, I have to point out that the set scale is clearly exaggerated and you, you, you can imagine that. So this is a typical, um, <coughs> a typical um, pitch here of let's say 10, 20 uh, micron. And on the other hand, we are talking about relatively low uh, deflection, low deflection angles for these um, analog micro mirror arrays. Um, and here you can see uh, the analog uh, functionality um, that I uh, mentioned um, on one of the first slides. Um, so we can operate these devices um, in a way that, that the deflections from, let's say, from a zero deflection 
uh, until a maximum deflection uh, can be realized with a lot of intermediate states. Um, and, and this is what we mean with um, analog um, micromirror arrays. Uh, in contrary to this uh, binary um, activation, mirror on, mirror off. Um, what is also clear, I can't go into too many details there, is that for this analog deflection, we end up with significantly lower deflection angles than uh, for um, a comparable uh, binary uh, device. Um, the mirrors, uh, the mirror areas are used as a programmable optical uh, grating. And I'll show you later what that means. So deflection curve um, characterization, you see some on the lower right, you see some uh, transient uh, behavior. So it's switching speed, it's damping, everything um, uh, is simulated up front and later on, of course, also measured. We have to look for mirror re reflectivities are of course very important. Um, as I mentioned, most of the devices have uh, some aluminum alloy. Um, at the moment, um, we can't offer a pure dielectric uh, stack uh, since that has to be, uh, um, uh, it's very complicated in, in, in structuring. Um, uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is a process um, detail issue. Okay, so um, applying such a um, diffractive um, micromirror array, what is the principle? How can you generate now a pattern? How can you project uh, gray, dark and bright uh, um, a pattern on some sort of uh, substrate uh, image plane? And this is illustrated here. Uh, the light, um, ideally narrow band, um, uh, coming here from the right and is impinging on the SLM. And the SLM is locally programmed, uh, deflected mirrors, uh, non-deflected mirrors. Um, the light that goes on to a area where the mirrors are non-deflected reflects the light into the zero diffraction order. Here is a Fourier lens and there's some projection optics behind. And this is the Fourier plane. So plane mirrors, ideally 100% of the light goes into the zero di uh, diffraction order. And if you de deflect the light, and in this case, uh, we let's say it's the blaze condition, uh, you, um, you deflect the mirrors and you move the intensity, for example, in the plus first or in the minus first or in both. Um, so that means you, you take the intensity uh, or, or this zone here generates um, intensity here in the Fourier plane in higher orders. And if you now apply an aperture, a Fourier stop here in this Fourier plane, uh, you, you transfer this information here into some uh, bright and dark uh, spots um, on your on your substrate. Um, on the right side, you see a very simple sketch, a very simple um, a simulation of this. Here is a zone of mirrors, um, several mirrors that are deflected, and in this case, uh, this should be the um, uh, the blaze condition, uh, so that all the intensity that goes onto these mirrors uh, are shifted in the first order, first diffraction order, which is shown here. And the intensity um, of the mirrors that are non-deflected, so the slits are neglected uh, in this simple uh, calculation here, all the intensity from here goes into the zero order. This passes the, uh, the aperture and creates um, bright spots um, on the substrate. Um, this here, light from here, does not pass this aperture and uh, the dark uh, spots are generated. Um, the interesting thing here now is that we, due to this analog functionality, 
we do not necessarily have to drive these mirrors into the place condition. That means shift all intensity from zero to plus one, but we can decide to um, address in some intermediate state. And that means you have an optical grating that is not, not optimized, not, not tuned in a certain way. So it means some intensity goes here and some intensity goes into higher diffraction orders. And by that, our customers can directly generate gray levels without time multiplexing. So that means you, on this uh, image plane, you get uh, uh, gray levels, even if you, let's say, look for one single um, laser shot, for example. So keep in mind, uh, analog functionality enables gray level pattern projection in real time without any um, um, time multiplexing. And this is essential uh, for several um, applications. Uh, it's, for example, not essential for this typical uh, BIMA um, application. So uh, time multiplexing there is absolutely fine and you don't need to do this uh, effort uh, uh, in case of a standard uh, BIMA projection. Okay, um, I already mentioned and I, I showed you several um, SEMs on tilting mirrors. This is just uh, an example of uh, piston type mirrors. Uh, you can see on the, on the left here, you can see the mirrors um, and uh, some underlying um, designs um, uh, for springs. So we have full control on these designs. We simulate them up front. Uh, know what's the basic behavior um, and can choose um, uh, the best um, for this um, for the specific application. By the way, uh, you see sometimes on the mirrors uh, some small holes um, optically, depending on the wavelength, of course, and the size of the holes, they are optically not really relevant and they have some uh, benefits um, in terms of the uh, processing and the removal of the sacrificial layer. Um, there are options with these holes and there are options without. So we are also looking into driving electronics and developing driving electronics. Uh, we started to do that uh, for the sole purpose of some internal uh, characterization. Of course, uh, it's a, it are complicated devices and uh, characterization needs uh, a careful addressing of these devices. Um, in the meantime, um, we have uh, developed this area um, up to a stage where customers are using these or comparable electronics uh, that we have designed uh, in, in their own tools. So we're not only offering development and low volume manufacturing of uh, the devices, but we are also um, developing and also um, supplying um, driving electronics. Um, this is maybe an interesting point. Uh, this is what we call a customer evaluation kit. Um, so it comes with a relatively small chip, this uh, 256 by 256 with tilting mirrors at the moment um, and some driving electronics. And then you have uh, directly the possibility of relatively easy entrance uh, to start some uh, testing um, in your lab before maybe we start developing some uh, application specific device uh, um, which is then, of course, higher effort. So some examples of MMA application and there as well, uh, this is um, material that is, of course, customer uh, released. Um, um, and this is one example um, in the area of photolithography, a very long cooperation with a Swedish company that uh, we are um, allowed to mention. Um, this is a, a mask writing tool for, for semiconductor uh, masks, an optical writing tool. Um, it's basically from the image formation, the same as I showed you um, on one of the previous slides. 
So here is the laser. Uh, it illuminates the SLM. The SLM is patterned. The laser flash and the SLM is synchronized properly. And then this pattern via Fourier lens and some aperture projection lens um, uh, brings the pattern uh, onto the substrate and then the substrate can be moved and flash on the fly uh, with the synchronization of the uh, stage position. Uh, this whole uh, substrate um, uh, is um, uh, illuminated. So, and what is on there is photoresist and it's illuminated and afterwards um, uh, developed and etched uh, the, the, the chromium or the layers. Um, uh, and this procedure, since you project uh, the whole area of this, this SLM with one laser flash um, uh, and uh, do not use a single beam, uh, this uh, concept of course is faster if you compare that to uh, standard uh, e-beam writers. Of course, uh, there is limitation uh, in, the, in the resolution. Of course, uh, um, high-end e-beam writers can realize much smaller feature sizes on the mask, but on the other hand, um, if you have a full mask set, it's still the case that a lot of uh, masks do not need uh, feature sizes um, extremely small, uh, so it can is, is still um, be used um, in, in actual um, uh, yeah, manufacturing of uh, masks uh, quite significantly. Um, by the way, uh, you could ask uh, what is here the benefit of this analog um, uh, feature uh, of the micro mirror array. It's a very essential one because uh, depending on this optics and the aperture, you not only can use the analog functionality uh, to produce a gray level, but if you tune the optics correctly and optimize it correctly, you can use the, the gray level capability of the SLM here uh, to do a fine positioning of uh, um, uh, features on the substrate here. Uh, so it's not only gray level producing, but you can shift uh, uh, feature edges um, uh, with uh, uh, some sort of subgrid only to mention that here. So also analog functionality of the SLM is essential in case of a standard uh, lithography. It's used for fine placing of pattern. Another example, same customer, um, this line device, uh, very fast one, uh, has been developed for uh, applications in uh, semiconductor backend or PCB manufacturing. Uh, just to give you an indication, the customer is able with uh, such uh, with with a key component here uh, to optically write um, a PCB um, uh, with a size of 50 by 50 centimeter with feature sizes smaller than 10 micron in, with a tagged uh, machine tagged a panel tagged in 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 the range of. Uh, 30 to 40 seconds, uh, and this is quite remarkable. Uh, the benefit here, special benefit um, uh, in, in uh, comparison to mask-based um, uh, illumination is that um, the system can uh, detect um, if the, the panels, the PCB panels, uh, are distorted, um, and on the fly, the, the, the writing uh, um, uh, features uh, can be um, adapted to that. Uh, and, and this is a flexibility that, that you can't have uh, with uh, mask-based um, tools. Another example, and this is more on a development uh, level, uh, this is spatial angular controls. Um, uh, of a microscopy illumination, and uh, this uh, stems from uh, several um, publicly funded projects, uh, also together on the application side with Institut Pasteur in uh, Paris. Um, and the idea here is to use uh, two SLMs, uh, incorporate that into an illumination for a microscope, 
and you see some lab prototype over here. Um, and what what can you do with these two um, SLMs in in this uh, programmable um, uh, illumination module? Uh, one SLM is used uh, to select uh, the area uh, in your field of view um, uh, in your microscope that you want to illuminate. So maybe you have some biological uh, um, tissue. Uh, some sample and you don't want to, for example, bleach um, uh, the whole area. So you can select, first of all, the area that is illuminated or the areas that are not illuminated. Um, and on the other hand, the second uh, functionality is you can select the angle under which this uh, area then is illuminated. And this gives, uh, in a 3D sample, this gives some extra um, uh, uh, performance uh, if you investigate a medical or biological uh, sample. Um, so this is uh, at the moment also uh, continued this work within um, a relatively new founded um, uh, Fraunhofer project center in Germany in Erfurt. Um, and uh, there we are cooperating with two other Fraunhofer institutes and one of the projects there is also uh, to, to develop this uh, microscopy um, module uh, idea further towards uh, some or giving it a higher um, uh, technology readiness level. So another idea is uh, using um, the SLMs uh, for some fast laser marking and engraving. Uh, what I showed you, and this is a strong history here, is illuminating photoresist. And now uh, we are looking into a little bit higher intensities uh, to um, um, process material directly. So there is no lithography, but we are really writing uh, directly with a laser uh, into the materials and not uh, as a, with a single beam, but uh, projecting um, the, um, uh, the area um, of our SLMs, our micromirror arrays. Um, of course, I have to, um, I, I have to admit we, we don't target uh, laser um, material um, applications uh, in the range of kilowatt. Um, so what uh, what is feasible here um, is um, mean uh, powers typically in the range of several 10 watt. Um, and um, we also try to use our capability of UV and deep UV um, uh, operation uh, since for several materials this is uh, uh, beneficial as well. So this is um, results from an internal Fraunhofer uh, a small small project. Um, this is not yet, um, uh, let's say, really in an in industrial application. Okay, then uh, I would like to point out some latest developments. Uh, I already mentioned that during the last years uh, we had a strong focus on the on the tilting uh, mirror developments. Um, and uh, so we, we don't have and can't follow our own roadmap. We, we always have to develop uh, according to the customer's needs. And um, yeah, due to that, um, the piston type mirrors uh, for several years um, were a little bit on hold, but uh, we see a significant interest in um, piston type mirrors. So phase modulating only devices um, again during the last years and that's why we started with some limited internal uh, effort um, uh, to, um, to reactivate the, the piston mirror arrays. Um, and what we did here is taking the 256 by 256 backplane and put um, piston type mirrors um, on top. That's the already mentioned modularity that we always uh, try to follow as much as possible. So and these are the first uh, first results on this. Uh, what you see here is uh, deflection in the range, analog deflection curve in the range of um, 400 nanometer deflection, which means that the phase modulation, so this is mechanical deflection, means that the phase modulation is twice that 
um, that value. Uh, this is not in a way the upper limit, it's just um, an intermediate status, uh, depends on the application and the wavelengths and so on, uh, whether you need higher uh, deflections to do a proper phase modulation. Um, and on the next slide, you see um, that this uh, works in reality. Um, and this is a sequence of white light interferometer measurements uh, uh, put together to, to form some sort of uh, slow motion um, movie. Um, this is only part of uh, the matrix 256 by 256. Um, uh, simply because the field of view in the white light in interferometer is, uh, is limited. Um, and uh, what you see here is some sort of wave pattern that we've programmed in and measured. Um, the speciality for the, um, for the segmented mirrors is that you nearly have no um, crosstalk between adjacent mirrors. And re that really means if we have a mechanical stroke of something like, let's say, 400 nanometer. In this case, adjacent mirrors can have this um, uh, stroke difference. And this is a big difference if you compare that to membrane mirrors, for example. The modularity we applied allows us now uh, to put uh, such a design, such mirrors um, on, a, on a larger backplane as well. So this is more or less then for demonstration purposes. Maybe one or the other application is fine with this uh, resolution. Maybe other applications need a higher pixel count and the modularity allows us to transfer such a design then also to a larger, uh, to a larger backplane. For example, the megapixel backplane that I've, um, that I've shown you um, earlier. So um, another very interesting, uh, relatively new development um, is um, not one tilt axis, not piston, but two tilt axis mirrors. And uh, that is shown on this slide. Um, on the uh, upper left, you, you see um, um, yeah, a sketch um, what, what flexibility the mirror then has um, in, in movement. Uh, so rotation, not only around one axis, but two axis. You see an um, SEM picture with um, a possible design uh, of springs. And this is once again the mirror plate here. Uh, you see the device on the lower left. Uh, it has something like 160,000 pixels here with a pitch of about 50 micron. Um, and in principle, such, uh, let's call it tip tilt mirror or two axis um, uh, tilt mirror technology, um, this as such is not new. So that has been, of course, demonstrated earlier. Um, quite new is the high integration level. So it's um, uh, to, to process a few mirrors or a small matrix uh, is one thing, but really uh, to integrate that in such a relatively large device and get full functionality here, this is um, yeah, um, a high effort and uh, there is a lot of know-how in this um, integration. On the lower right, you see some examples, white light interferometer surface profiles, uh, areas of this, uh, mirror area with uh, mirrors deflected in, in different uh, directions. So in principle, once again, each mirror is controlled individually. And uh, these are just some examples of pattern that you could uh, write in. Um, what, only as one example, what can you do with such uh, two axis micro mirror arrays? Um, you can do light steering. Um, and if you remember um, uh, on, on the previous slides, uh, the other with the, with the one tilt axis, the way to uh, generate um, a pattern always included that you waste light. So you, you, you um, lead some of the light 
into an aperture, into some sort of beam dump. In this case, if you have a two-axis micromirror array and I have to, to stress that and a suitable illumination for that, uh, coherence plays uh, or non-coherence plays a really important role here. If you have such a device, you can redirect the light. So it means these patterns here are generated by redirecting light from dark zones to the, the bright zones that you want to write. And for some of the uh, applications, for example, laser light uh, is, is very costly and uh, this is a very interesting feature. For other applications, uh, light um, usage is not that critical and then you can use um, other schemes. Okay, so um, I'm basically uh, at the end of my talk, um, try to wrap up. Um, I hope that I could um, give an indication that micromirror arrays enable uh, versatile, really high-speed light modulation, uh, different wavelengths, deep UV at the moment to NER, um, that highly integrated MMA um, are processed at Fraunhofer IPMS in surface MEMS technology. Um, and uh, we can, we have full control on the mirror functionalities, of course, uh, within physical limitations, but full control on mirror functionalities, uh, piston uh, tilt, uh, tip tilt, uh, perspectively, also the combination of uh, all of these functionalities, um, but that is uh, some some future perspective. Outlook, um, there are interesting applications that we are at the moment addressing and we are looking forward to extend that, for example, towards holography for real 3D, um, maskless direct writing for direct imaging, compressed sensing, and many, many more. Yeah, that's basically um, the end of my uh, talk. Um, thank you very much for uh, your attention. And uh, of course, I would love to get into touch with you to discuss um, your requirements. At this point, I would like to hand back to um, Andreas for um, moderation. Yeah, thank you, uh, Michael, for sharing your experience with us. Uh, now we have some time for some questions. We already have some. Um, uh, Michael, the first question, what are minimum and maximum micromirror size that you can think are feasible to develop in general for integrated micromirror devices? Okay, so... Um... There are, in principle, no hard upper and uh, lower limits. Um, what I can say is that at the moment we're active. What, I, what I've shown is uh, devices that we already have realized uh, in the range of 10 micron pitch uh, or mirror size uh, up to something like uh, 50. Um, we are working at the moment um, uh, on the upper limit, let's say towards something like 70, so 70 micron pitch, and as something like a lower limit, uh, um, we are simulating, thinking about something like 4 micron mirror pitch. Um, if I would say it a little bit more general and uh, looking far into the future, I would say it's realistic to talk about something between one micron and 100 micron. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next question has two parts. Uh, can we use it for data communication? And if yes, what kind of bit rate can be expected or reached? Um, sorry, what, what kind of? Um, uh, can, can this technology as the SLM, can it be used for data communication? Mm -hmm. And if yes, what bit rate? What bit rate? Okay. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, in principle, yes, uh, we think. So we're at the moment not active in this area, um, but um, we think it can be used. There are discussions, for, for example, uh, uh, about some wavelength selective uh, switching, uh, where also spatial light modulators at the moment, I think it's uh, uh, most of it is um, uh, LCD based, are used. Um, so yes, we think there are uh, different um, uh, options um, in the um, communication area. Um, bit rate, um, what what we can um, let's say uh, talk about is uh, switching rates of the matrix. I don't know whether this exactly uh, uh, correlates with bit rates that are transferred. So you in in an optical um, uh, communication channel, uh, you you uh, you might have a relatively high bit rate, but not necessarily switching between channels uh, in the same uh, speed. So I, I, I think the, these are two different uh, things. Um, and on the other hand, uh, um, data rates um, in terms of SLM speed, you, you can make a rough calculation if we have a, uh, an, an 8000 pixel device operating at one megahertz and then having, let's say, uh, six bit uh, um, uh, gray level depth then then you have uh, what we would call is the data rate uh, for the for the SLM okay uh, one more question uh, what is the front of a scenario after finishing development if higher volumes or process one processing volumes are required yeah yeah that's a good question um, uh, Fraunhofer, we are, um, of course, mainly focusing on doing uh, um, research and development. Um, but uh, I clearly want to say um, that we are able, capable and willing, and we are also doing that uh, low volume uh, um, processing, um, uh, because this is um, a niche where industry typically is not interested to. So clearly, uh, we don't want to compete with industry. If there is um, a foundry out there that uh, sees um, uh, a good perspective in manufacturing these things, uh, then we are um, willing to transfer the, uh, um, the process um, so that um, the third party then can do the manufacturing. And this would be solu the solution for uh, for higher volumes, let's say development at Fraunhofer, a low volume manufacturing at Fraunhofer and beyond a certain limit and transferring uh, the process um, to an external foundry. Hey, good, thanks, Michael. This was the last question so far. Uh, if any question from your side arise after the webinar, Please feel free to contact us or me directly. Uh, we will also join the Photonics 2019 exhibition in Makuhari, Japan, which will be held beginning of December. So you <laughs> please feel free to visit our booth also as well. In the next webinar on 5th of December, Ms. Christine Rufford will talk about the power of micro pump, a big idea in a small package. So we also warmly welcome you for the next session of our webinar. Finally, uh, thanks once more for joining us today uh, and hope to welcome you at the next uh, webinar session in December. So thanks and have a nice day.